Welcome back. Always a pleasure to see you. I hope you didn't lose too much money betting on the Eagles last night. <laughs> this week, we are going to talk about and analyze a film noir from 1953, directed by an English-American woman, Ida Lupino, a rarity for the period, as you can imagine, very, very few women were able to direct movies during that period. In 1953, Ida was already at her fourth or fifth feature. However, this was her big success. A film with a low budget, 200,000 roughly. A few weeks, it took a few weeks, it wasn't rushed. And the profits were multiples of the amount that was put into this. Ida herself didn't direct too many films after this one and went back mostly to her career as an actress. She came from a family from parents who were in show business and by the way her last name Lupino is of Italian origin but distant in the past. Her father Stanley Lupino was a descendant of a family of artists, actors, that was touring Europe and ended up in England in the 17th century when Italian crews were going around with the Commedia dell'arte, right? Staging productions, both in theaters and also in piazzas, the streets, etc. In reference to our plans for the week, keep in mind that Today, I'm going to use a series, a selection of frames from the film to illustrate both the contents, the themes, but more importantly, the style of the film, something that I will continue on Thursday. But Thursday, I will also introduce the first possible choice for the final paper, a film by the Coen brothers, Inside Lewin Davis. I will talk a little bit, give you an idea, give you a sense of what the movie is about in case you want to explore that option. And I will continue with one film from that short list, which is comprising of four films until spring break. Friday, the viewing notes are on detour, and I thought it would be more convenient to move the assignments under the week of the film and I'll do that from now on. So if you go to uh, week four, uh, The Hitchhiker, you find not only all the readings, the notes, but at the very end, you find also the assignment. Next week, for the first time, after we talk about Il Sorpasso, an Italian film from 1962, I think, the early 1960s, we will discuss the format of the film essay because on next week's film, instead of the viewing notes, you're supposed to write a short essay. Not a huge difference other than the format, which has to be a narrative format. And I'll give you tips, I'll give you a template. And also, I will give you specific suggestions for that kind of film, particularly. In, in uh, particular. Today, I forgot to print this morning. I realized at the last moment I didn't print the uh, pages for the attendance. So if anyone has a big notebooks with pages with lines and uh, if you can separate a page from the notebook and circulate it, I would invite you to write your name last first in print letters and then sign next to it. Can I ask you the favor to use one of the pages there? And you can wait maybe five or ten minutes and then send it around. Thank you so much. Okay. I haven't posted this PDF, which is a selection of about a third of the frames in the film, uh, but uh, uh, I will later on. However, you do find a PDF with frames from the whole movie taken at intervals of two seconds. This is how the film begins. This is the very first frame. Once again, keep in mind that, as it happens for all kinds of films from this period, 
You also find a colorized version on Amazon, for example. Stay away from that. Uh, use the links that you find inside week four to go to the correct original black and white version of the film. And this is the very first frame. Uh, perhaps we can do the usual lower the curtains so that we can see a few more details from this image. And if that's not enough, then we can also lower the lights. You let me know, okay? Excuse me. Thank you. As I was saying, this is how the film begins. Not uncommon for films from this period to begin with a text, but the text is highly significant in framing the whole story and also the experience of the viewers. Of course, don't forget that besides the text, behind the text, there is also an image that will be developed in the following sequence. And clearly already you see that you have a road with asphalt and that you have someone, you see their shoes, you see part of them, but you don't see their whole profile. More importantly, you see their shadow extending through the road, somewhat ominously, and also in with, with a, a, a manner that is reminiscent of European expressionist films, the use of shadows. You found some of that even in Detour. If you remember, there is a scene where we see Sue singing and instead of the players of the band, you just see their profiles on a white background at an odd angle. And the reference to the expressionist style of European films is also relevant for us because this is indeed a film noir or a cross between a film noir and a crime drama. Let's look at the text. This is the true story of a man and a gun and a car. So first thing they want to tell you, this is fact, and they end with the same warning, for the facts are actual. However, what you see through the rest of the text that you have in front of you doesn't ring as factual, right? It is essential like a story, a narrative or a fictional story, right? So it might be based on facts. It was and it wasn't. But what you find here is typical of a film noir where you have an essentialist approach to the treatment of the story where the characters are deprived of the usual details that make them three-dimensional real. Even in here, you don't find much of a background story for any of the protagonists. And you don't find the context in their life outside of the story. There is nothing outside the story. A film noir achieves a certain sense of, a certain feeling of tension by focusing obsessively on the context of the story. And the narrower the context of the story is, in this case, it couldn't be more narrow because most of the film is shot inside a car. The narrower the context, the more you feel the sense of oppression. You don't see much of society. You don't see the families, the friends, the social network of the characters at any time in the film. Whereas, if this had been, for example, a true crime drama, you would have expected to see some semblance of harmony within a family, a social group, society in general, to be then broken by the criminal events, to be then possibly restored at the very end. Nothing here. So they're saying true, they're saying facts, 
But then what you read, read reads like a parable, right? With characters that are essential type. What are the main characters according to this text? The story of a man and a gun and a car. Now, interestingly, there are three protagonists, three main characters in this film. The two that are not mentioned here are these two guys who live in El Centro, California, very close to the border with Mexico, not too far from the border with Arizona. And these two guys who allegedly are married, they've known each other for a long time. Possibly they've been in the war together. One of them mentions the war. They don't say which war. And given that this is 1953, the film was shot in 1952, it could be the North Korea, the Korean War that was being fought at that point, but more probably, since they're not very young, more probably the war they talk, to, to talk about is World War II. So these two guys, uh, very early in the morning, are in their car. They have uh, organized a, a trip to go fishing to a place called the Chocolate Mountains, which is in Arizona. And at some point, one of them says, why don't we go south? Why don't we take a turn? And, and we all know about detour, right? The idea of a detour of the deviation, which precipitates a lot of unwanted events. Eventually, these two guys will pick up a criminal who's hitchhiking, who has been on a killing spree. This criminal has been hitching rides and then killing the occupants of the cars that gave him a ride. And when he gets in the car with the two friends who are going fishing, they will stay together after that, up to the end of the film. The two, uh, after they, they take on board uh, the criminal, will continue to go south in that peninsula that you find uh, uh, at the end of uh, California. And they will end up in Santa Rosalia, where the film will finish. So we don't see them in the context of their houses, their families, their social context at the beginning of the movie. But we don't even see any of that at the end of the film. We don't have any kind of happy family reunion, any sense of elation or satisfaction. To confirm that, we will see their expressions. It is indeed a film noir. You understand that because even before anything dangerous, risky is happening, there is a sense of depression. There is a low vibe, a low mood. So right now, no reference to those two guys, just a criminal, a man and a gun and a car. The gun belonged to the man. This is necessary to make you understand that it is a criminal, most probably, but notice the inclusion of the car, right? So the gun defines the man, and in many ways that is true, that the identity of the criminal is predicated on the visual presence of the gun, the handgun in his hand, and it is also true that by the end of the film, when the Mexican police is arresting him, and taking the gun from him, actually, it'll be one of the two hostages who slaps his hand, finally, and the gun uh, drops to the ground. At that point, he changes completely. He's a completely changed man. He's not cruel, sadistic, um, twisted, but becomes completely taken, overcome by fear, by desperation. Okay, so the gun defines his identity, but the car is also there. And the fact that you have the car within this narrative, this short narrative, means that the car itself has something negative attached to it. 
because the car is the instrument of detours, of deviations that take you away from your community, but also from the values that keep you anchored to sanity. The car might have been yours. So they're suggesting that from this point on, that the viewers should immerse themselves into the film and that the film is not only, not just the experience of the tension, of the fear that is experienced by the two men who are taken hostage and kept hostages with the prospect that they must be killed at the end, but also the idea that you have in some ways to ask yourself the same ethical questions that are underlying the story. That is to say, what should you have done? What could you have done in the same kind of situation? So could it be yours or that young couple across the aisle? What you will see in the next 70 minutes could have happened to you. Notice, in fact, as a confirming what I just said, that it doesn't say could happen to you, but could have happened, meaning what if this had happened to you? How would you have behaved differently? 70 minutes is normal for this kind of dramatic film uh, from the period. Nowadays, it's rare to find films that are shorter than 75 minutes or longer than 100 minutes and screenplays tend to be around 100, 110, maximum 120 pages, because the assumption is that there is a traditional conventional template, one page of script uh, is one minute of shooting, but oftentimes these days less than that because lines tend to be shorter, okay? As far as the facts, well, there was a famous criminal from that same period, he, he was active in 1950, arrested in 1951, Billy Cook. You find uh, plenty of information in the readings and links if you want to learn more about it. He, in fact, went on what used to be called in the language of the newspapers of the period and the police reports of the period, a killing spree meaning that within a short period of time, he killed several people, including a whole family that gave him a ride. And he kept them hostages for 72 hours. And at the end, he killed them all, including the kids. I think there were three kids uh, with this couple. He was arrested, he was brought to trial and uh, uh, sentenced to death and executed. Uh, Ida Lupino, uh, reached out to the jail, went to see him. She initially had the idea that she wanted to make a docudrama of sorts or a criminal drama heavily based on the horrible details of uh, the, the events that led to the arrest of this criminal. But, you know, in, inside the moralistic cinema industry of the period, this was frowned upon that the idea being that even if you depict a criminal doing criminal activities, you're still making him the center of the screen and in some ways you're making a hero. You're giving him notoriety. And this was considered immoral. So she was criticized while the movie was still being in, in the first stages of production. And uh, um, she, she wasn't listening to that to criticism, not responding to it. She, she was a strong woman, clearly must have been, but we know she was. And they put legal issues on the table. They said, well, but you need permission. You didn't secure permission from the uh, judicial system to visit him with the purpose of uh, getting material for a story, so there might be some liabilities. She ended up having to fictionalize the story. Uh, she borrowed ideas from the conclusion of a novel and uh, used 
a professional screenwriter, but actually most of the screenplay is by Ida herself and her former husband, Calder Young. Both were producers because Ida was not just one of the very few directors, female directors of the period. She was also a producer. She put, up, she, she created her own uh, production company. She called it initially the em Emerald, and then the, the filmmaker Emerald was the stage name of her mother in England. Okay? So, even through this selection, one frame every two seconds, so that gives you a sense of the development of the scene. And keep in mind, the format is still four by three with a black band added by me because I captured the lines in here. Didn't want to have them on top of the image. So this is the premise. And of course, they keep it long enough for the audience to read this. And so you see. I'm clicking, and it's still the same image, and no movement behind it. And then, finally, you transition from that image of a road to black. And notice that we go from there. Filmmakers, we just want them not to, is the production company Ida had at that point. And notice that... We transition from that uh, dramatic text to a gun. And this is a very famous frame showing a gun, not really pointed at you, the viewers, but it's clear that it is pointed at you. And, and, and the quarter, the, the, the angle shot, the three quarter angle shot, is made so that you can see the details of this revolver gun. Right, that you can see them better, both the revolver and the hand holding it. Okay, so again, it's pointed at you. Now, keeping in mind that you don't really see a representation of regular society, people involved in regular daily activities, but you only see the hostages, the criminal, and the police for the most part. There are possible other possible readings of this, including keep in mind that guns are in the hands of criminals or in the hands of the police. And it's really the citizens that are unarmed in the middle. And also, eventually you have to ask yourself, what is the film really about? Since it is so essential, and it is not just a criminal drama, and at that point, you can load this image, which we will see through a series of frames with symbolic signification. It's 1953. What is happening in the US? Well, the Korean War is about to come to an end. And it was a bloody war. A lot of people died. The end result was not politically satisfying. More importantly, it was clear by then, if it wasn't to everyone, that the US were involved in the Cold War, in an indirect war with the USSR and uh, also with Marxist communist China. So the pointed gun is, in fact, possibly also a symbol of imminent danger, the danger of a new war, and also the danger of the atomic bomb. By then, by the end of the 1940s, the, the Soviet Union had developed the atomic bomb, so they had atomic bombs, and already by 1953, uh, they, were, they were working on hydrogen bombs, so even more powerful. So keep that in mind, that Cold War era reading is, in my mind, possible and pertinent. Okay, so you see the gun, and you see it more now without the titles, right? And you see it's a very extreme close-up, right? The barrel looks like the barrel of a cannon, almost. And nothing behind that. Notice that up to this point, and for the next few minutes of the film, we don't really see a full human profile. 
which creates the state of tension. You cannot really identify, put a body or put a face behind that. You just know that there is a sense of danger, risk. So the style is being used to unsettle the viewers. Have the title on top of that. So you know there is a connection between the gun and hitchhiking. And now we go back to the road. Once again, now the character has moved, right? You see movement, it's, it's not a static image. And you start seeing more about it, but just a few clues that become apparent, right? Because through the frames, this is kept on the screen through the initial part of the credits, you can study the image. So you see shoes that are typical of lower class people in the US during the 1930s and 40s. You see this style of pants that are also typical of workers during that period. You see a leather jacket, you would see it on a computer screen. Here, we don't have as many details. A black leather jacket that is not the kind of jacket a poor man would, uh, would have worn. Right. And then, as usual, you see the projection, the long projection of the shadow. And you see the man walking on the road. Again, the beginning is reminiscent of what we've seen in Detour. At the beginning of Detour, you have Al, Al Roberts, the former piano player, walking on the road, being passed by cars, and then hitchhiking, hitching a, a ride. You see this man, but again, you don't see their face. And now you see him extending the arm in the act of hitchhiking. And for the first time, you see something that is reminiscent of society. And clearly, from this moment on, there is a clear contrast that the viewer of the period would have caught. That is to say, you have these poor men's shoes, the pants of someone who's working possibly working in a place, then going to another place, right? But the car that enters the frame, of course, from this angle, because it is the best way to have, uh, to, to shoot this, if you have a four by three uh, lens camera, the car is an expensive car. And the couple that we will see from a distance are a wealthy couple. Okay? And they'll give him a right notice. As I said, the, the credits give credit for the screenplay to Collier Young, the former husband they divorced in 1951, the year before the film was shot, and Ida Lupino, and the person who adapted this from reality and from the end of a novel is listed with a minor, a secondary role. Okay? Now, once again, the image is cut in. You don't see the, the, the people in the car. Once again, you don't see the whole car. Through the first few minutes of the film, there is a fragmentary view of reality. It's like reality is being disgregated, right? We're talking about crimes breaking up society and threatening the sense of the organization of society and the values of society. And this is translated into this approach, right, of fragments. With some insistence on the details, the wheels, of course, are very clear, right, because of the wide uh, tire side of the tire. You remember that detail. But then they'll insist a lot on the license plate because then it will become part of the crime scene. Okay. So you don't see everything because this is a no not a normal scene. This is not regular life, right? It is something else. And as we said many times, the film noir has to produce a certain vibe, a certain kind of tension. Instead of going 
to show you the couple in the car, they go to the back of the car. They don't show you the hitchhiker, they don't show you the couple, just the back of the car and the plate. But again, it is a fragment, it is something that will connect this event to the scene of the crime when the poor couple will be found dead by a policeman. But keep in mind what I said about the ambivalence. The gun, criminal and criminals and cops have guns. And this view of the license plate, who's interested in the license plate? It's the police. It's the police that is surveilling the roads. And this theme of surveillance, of being controlled more than protected by the police, is also present throughout the movie. And gives a negative, darker twist to the presence of the police. Also, the badge is very prominent. Dodge, right? So it's important. Doesn't have much sense now as a viewer, but within a minute, it will have that sense. Again, see how your attention is being focused on this detail. And you know that exactly because it doesn't make sense for you to be seeing these things that something is about to happen. That this will have a meaning that you don't expect. Because when you see people hitching a ride, you don't expect to have to remember the license plate or the brand of the car. Now, you barely see the couple. Again, you, you see they're at the top of the shot. They're barely, their heads are barely in the shot. And you see that the wife has been sliding towards the driver, the husband, in order to accommodate the driver. And you can see, once again, shiny, new car, expensive car, open top car. So middle class couple, right? If not upper middle class. And you see the road, and they're going away, right? The film was produced by RKO, which was the uh, production, the, the, the company owned by Howard Hughes. And now, darkness again. And again, a shot that is not giving you the whole scene, but just fragments of the scene. You're very low, and you can see the ground. You can see that we're in the woods or in a rural area, right? And we continue. Now, from the darkness, what emerges is the image of a tire, and you recognize the white side of the tire. You start reading, and then you'll be able to read Dodge in here on the hub, on the cup. But once again, instead of giving you the whole scene, we are focusing on fragments of this. The door of the car that is about to open, the wheel, and we see the door opening. As you can see from the captions, we hear a woman screaming, gunshots, because the couple has been killed, and you see the... Uh, peculiar shoes of the man who hitched the ride, his pants, right, the style of his pants. And now you see a female bag purse on the floor, on the ground. You see objects coming out, cigarettes, other objects. And you know that normalcy has been broken. That everything that is normal and familiar is to the ground because the crime has broken that familiarity, right? Has intruded that intimate private space. And in fact, even though we don't see him and who he is, we see his hand going to rummage through the purse and you see more objects belonging to the woman. And so the crime is told indirectly through those objects. Again, something that you, uh, have seen as a style even at the end of Detour when Al has killed unintentionally, allegedly Vera and he goes into the room and you have that in focus, out of focus but you also see all the objects around the, the room that gives you a sense of the crime that has been committed that a person who used those objects is now dead Again, you just see the shoes. The man is going away, but you don't see who he is. 
And this is the end of the credit. Name of the director. And now you will see the first person. Who is the first person that you see with a regular shot? A policeman. Okay. So there is a sense of the police is there to protect you, but the police fails to protect the protagonist uh, until the very end. So you see the light, right? The light is the flashlight of the policeman, and you see the license plate. Now you know, because you've seen it before, that this is the same couple. Then you see the same car, but again, you see bits and pieces through the lights, and before you just saw the familiar small objects, now you see pieces of bodies, dead bodies, right? This is the skirt of the woman, a shoe, and a foot there that is not moving because she was killed. And you see, typical, right? The angle of the foot tells you that this is not a living body, right? Because it's a strange, twisted posture. And the hand without life and the policeman. You see the fancy car, the interior of this fancy car. And from there, you go to the newspaper, typical films from the period, to give you quickly a little bit of information through newspaper articles sh uh, shown on the screen. And, and they have this uh, uh, fake newspaper, the Journal Express, Couple found murdered, and they keep it on the screen so you can see it. Incidentally, if you look at everything else, everything else is also negative. An earthquake here, burglars here, uh, and uh, some problems. Oh, yeah, uh, thefts of gems here. So you know that a couple has been killed. You know now that there is a development. The next title tells you that there is a search, that the criminal is being pursued. And again, some other negative news, fraud, tax. Okay, And now you have a name, Emmett Myers, is the name given to the criminal, based loosely on Billy Cook. The most important connection is that both the real criminal, Billy Cook, and Emmett have a an eye, an eyelid that is paralyzed, so he cannot close his eye, and this was achieved by the actor with some tape blocking his eyelid. Kind of weird, simply as an effect. More, right? More detail now from just a couple is murdered to the hitchhiker is being pursued. They're trying to find him, and now. Besides the, the, the name, you have a face. So you have this photo of the criminal before you see him on the screen, right? The story of a man and a gun and a car. Right. So be on the lookout for this man, says the article. And then a close shot of this included this strange gaze, right? So it's a traditional drama slash noir film. So they're playing a lot on the dark negative depiction, physical depiction of the criminal. That is to say, you have to look at this face and you know it's a criminal, right? Because of the deformity caused by the eye, because of the expression. And through the movie, the movie will be based a lot on the first shots or close shots of the faces of the three protagonists Criminal on one side, the two uh, family fathers, regular men, uh, next to him in the car. And again, same script, and this point you know how it will end, right? The visuals carry the story, because you don't see him, you don't see Emmett, you just see him by the side of the road, the shadow is cast, and you know how this will end. Right At this point, because of the visual, without having to tell you much, you know what the pattern will be. Someone stops. This time it's not a fancy car, because everyone has to be afraid. And the driver slides to open the door and invite him in. 
just a single man. He gets in, you don't see him, you just see the car, the car is leaving. Then you see the headlights of the car in the darkness, they are going into a wood, and you know, again, you know what to expect uh, from, from this, that the poor guy will be taken, and keep in mind, it's two seconds when I'm advancing, just two seconds, so this happens very quickly, and you see, once again, the limp hand of the man that is being killed, and the hands of the criminal going through his wallet the same way that he was going through the purse of the poor woman. So the pattern is clear, and you see the gun. And you recognize, because it's a peculiar kind of gun, the same gun that you saw in the beginning, the initial shot of the film, and the guy just leaves. However, this time he takes the car. And now, same thing, you see headlights and already you're thinking, oh my God, what is going to happen now? But this time, this is the Plymouth uh, uh, Cranbrook, uh, by, uh, owned by one of the two characters, the other two protagonists, who will be taken hostage eventually. Notice, however, it's all dark, right? They're driving in the dark, the early hour in the, of the morning, nothing wrong because they have a long trip, because they're fishermen, there are all kinds of reasons for that. But notice the mood in the car. So these are the two friends who've known each other from before the war, according to a line that we we'll see later on. They're going on a trip. One of them here, Gilbert, will say, this is the first trip since the war, the first time that I'm not with my wife, my family going out, are they happy? Is this a portrait of happiness and joy, harmony, to be shattered by crime? Not at all. From the, very, from the beginning, this is, you, feel, you feel that this is not crime drama, but it's a film noir, because there is this vibe, there is this heaviness, there is this intrinsic tension, right? They're going out to fish, and they're not happy at all. They're not having fun. That's sure, right? And there is a certain intensity in Gilbert. This is Roy. Roy is a, owns a car garage. This is Gilbert. Gilbert works as a designer, so he's more educated, allegedly. Both have been to war. In fact, you see through the movie that Gilbert is wearing military pants and military boots. And there is a certain intensity, especially in Gilbert. Roy, you can see that Roy is more of a good guy, not too smart, uh, not too decisive, determined, not really driven. And in fact, his reaction with the criminals, criminal, his reactions will be passive aggressive for the most part. You feel more power, more intensity with Gilbert, yet Gilbert himself will not be able to react, overcome, uh, uh, try anything significant against the criminal through the movie. So it becomes a long nightmare. Controlled by this criminal, who at some point will tell them, before the end, you will be killed, right? He needs them to get to this place, to get on a boat, on a ferry, to go to another place in Mexico and escape the police hunting for him. but. Once it's done with them, they will be killed by the others. But from the beginning, you find this kind of intensity and habits. And the detour. When you get to the next intersection, says Gilbert, why don't you turn south? Oh, little did I know that this would prompt, precipitate these events. So you have this sense that deviation and the kind of deviations that are allowed by the mobility afforded by a car are dangerous. Already, they've left their family, they've left their community to go someplace else. Now they're deviating and deviating into Mexico. And, and of course, we should so talk about the representation of Mexico in here, which is kind of an exotic place, a sinful place, as we'll see from Mexicali, the place where men can go to see strippers, 
get drunk and perhaps go with prostitutes. And also at the same time, Mexico in here is also a rural country, pre-industrial, and where, where people are like children, naive, sincere, authentic, everything that the US has lost in a way. So the deviation and the punishment, right? So this deviation is significant, the deviation from the road, changing their destination, not going to Arizona fishing, going to Mexico. They're still going to fish, but we know how it ends. We know what they're exposed to before they get there, okay? So, as I said before, it's clear that Roy is kind of a doofus. So Roy says, well, chocolate mountains are east. Why should I deviate? Where they were the last time we had it that way, okay? So, doesn't understand. And Gilbert says, who needs the mountain? How do we get to San Felipe? And San Felipe is not too far from the border with California. You can find everything again. They're from Los Centro. California, uh, they cross into Mexico, drive through Mexicali, which is very close to the border, and they go south uh, from there to go to San Felipe and fish, but they'll never get there. Okay, once again, look at their faces. Even after this deviation, they're not having fun. They're not saying, yeah, we're going to San Felipe. We're going to Mexico. No, 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 not at all. So it's dark outside, they're in the car, and, and something is about to happen. You feel that even though it's not justified, right? This kind of mood, these faces are not justified, it's just part of the film. And notice how, similarly to Detour, how lights and darkness are used on those faces and the angle, right? They're not at eye level. The, the camera is here, and they probably used, the, the car was not very expensive, they probably had two or three, they probably took apart some of the cars in order to install the cameras on the dashboard or uh, in, the, in the footwell, but it's an angle from below that accentuate the contrast between light and shadow and gives a visual sense of impending doom. Okay, so here we go. Go fishing, not very happy, even though, and now Roy has this idea. Now, now Roy finally gets it. He said, oh, we might pick up a drink in Mexicali. Keep in mind, the, the, the subtitles are not always correct, and Mexicali should be spelled with an I, but it's not the only mistake that I have in here. So finally speaking up, oh, so we're having fun. We're not fishing, we're having fun, because Mexicali is like a small Mexican Las Vegas. And, and from there, it's not just a drink. The drink is the first idea. It's like a child. Oh, remember Floribel at the Alhambra Club? So they must have had some kind of dalliance with this woman who was working at this club. And the other, the serious one, says, yeah, but... She's, he says, she's probably dead by now. It was a long time ago. So we know that they've been there uh, probably in the 1930s when they were younger. But dead by now is not really a reference to the poor Floribel. Because Floribel herself cannot, cannot have been that old if there was something between them. It's the idea that this is pa the past. This is dead to us. We are not young. Now we're married, we're mature men, so we don't do those things anymore. So what is that is this kind of activity, this kind of part of their past at this point. But notice the faces. Yeah, Roy is smiling a little bit, the other not as much at all. And now even Roy is not smiling anymore because he feels the negative vibe from Gilbert, right? Yeah, okay, we, I, I get you. It says, yeah, poor old Floribel, meaning, yeah. Uh, so this is not on the list. He makes another attempt. There is no harm in drinking a toast to her. It says, 
Are we still drinking? No women, but at least a drink, at least booze, if no women. And the other doesn't respond. But he adds this, which is significant. You know, except for the war, this is the, this is still Gilbert talking. First time I'm away from Mori and the kids. So first time these two men have gone out, and of course everything will go horribly wrong. Let me continue for a few minutes, and then I'll stop. And at this point, since Gilbert has pissed on every good plan by Roy, he says, you want to turn back? Yeah, what, what's the point? Let's go home. We cannot have booze. We cannot have women. Uh, he says, well, we've come this far. And, and they continue. Okay. And Gilbert goes to sleep on the side of the car. And, and, and this is part, again, of a pattern that we've seen even with t Detour. Sleeping or pretending to be asleep. Because look what, look what happens. They get to Mexicali, which again is very close to the border with California, and we start seeing lights. Because it is being depicted like Las Vegas. Of course, they never went there. They shot everything in California or inside, inside studio sets. Uh, so the lights, you see the signs are just fake. Uh, and you think that Gilbert is asleep Roy instead is all excited like a kid. Oh, the lights, the women, the bars. And he would like to stop. Eventually, he will have to continue simply because Gilbert pretends to be asleep the whole time and Roy doesn't have enough initiative to simply decide to park the car, shake Gilbert and say, let's go inside, let's have a drink. So... Gilbert is pretending to be asleep because he doesn't want to commit the sin. He doesn't want to be tempted by the lights and the women and the booze of Mexicali. He wants to remain this uh, upstanding citizen, law-abiding citizen, family, father, and husband. Okay? Whereas, again, Roy is a simpleton. So, look, you see more and more lights. And see the smile of on Roy, you see all the lights, the cabaret, the dancing, the bars, old studio fair, <coughs> doesn't know what to do, more temptations, smiling, savoring what will happen, eventually they stop and someone says, benvenidos caballeros, benvenidos amigo, and there is someone, you know, those guys that used to be very common, even in New York, up, up until the 1980s, guys bringing people inside a club, but it's pretending to be asleep. And in fact, you don't see here, because of course it's a shot every two seconds, but at some point you see he opens it half an eye just to see what is going on, to make sure that they're driving through and past Mexicali, and also to make you, the viewers, understand that it was just a ruse so that they wouldn't be tempted to go into a bar, get drunk, uh, end up with a prostitute, etc. And the, the guy is mention, mentioning Juanita starting a famous fan dance. A fan dance was a stripping act, right? When strippers wouldn't uh, take all their clothes completely, they, they would use big fans to cover parts of her body and reveal them. Uh, Okay, so it's important to know what they're talking about. He's talking about a club with strippers. And Roy turns, he's expecting the other to make a decision. Keep that in mind when you see them confronting the criminal. He's the strong one. He's the one with the leadership. He's the one who should be deciding. But when they're confronted with a criminal, no big leadership, no big decisions come from him. And they... He doesn't respond, and so they continue. Roy is not happy, and they're going to San Felipe. But you see once again the shoes and the ground, so you know that the criminal is about to commit another act, and the next act is to hitch a ride with them. And, and from that point, you have the more intense part of the film with the three of them inside the car, 
and the criminal keeping them hostage, and I will continue on Wednesday.